Steve, I'd love to know your first reaction when somebody approaches you about playing the uh, legendary uh, Stan Laurel. Um, well, it was, uh, I was flattered and uh, uh, daunted, um, but uh, also excited because um, it, it was, uh, you know, it's sort of a great opportunity um, to celebrate the lives of uh, Laurel and Hardy. And uh, it was a legendary character actor and writer. Um, and I felt, uh, when Jeff asked me if I'd, uh, uh, and John S. Baird, the director, said, will you play this? Uh, I, was, I was anxious, because I, I wanted to get it right. But I, uh, I thought I had, uh, I thought um, my resume was as good as anyone else's for this particular role. And uh, so I, I went into it with my eyes open, and I was reassured, and uh, and my doubts and, and anxieties were put to rest when John C. Riley came on board because um, I had such huge respect for John. Uh, I didn't I know him that well; I knew him a little bit, but uh, not that well. And uh, but I'd always respected his all his career choices and his. Um, his work, the detail in his work, and some honesty to what he does. And uh, he's one of those few actors who's able to play dramatic roles and comedy roles and knows how to be truthful and funny at the same time. And um, so I thought we would complement each other. Um, and yeah. I always wonder when an actor's approached about playing somebody that's so iconic and, and so familiar to people, you know, the look and the sound and everything. Do you think, oh, why, why would you think of me for that? Or do, do, I, don't, I don't look like him, or whatever, whatever the case may be. Did, did you have any uh, hesitations along those lines? Uh, well, no, I didn't. Not when John was on. John and I are exactly the height of Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. Um, so when we stood next to each other, we were like, this is, this is pretty good for, for, you know, from, uh, uh, from uh, straight off the bat. Uh, you know, I thought we were, we were in a good place. Um, and we had makeup, we had these big, you know, uh, John had a huge bottom of his face was all uh, fake and I had a false chin and, and ears and the, we had the best people in the, in the business uh, um, helping us with that. Um, but, uh, 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 yeah, I mean, it was, uh, you know, it, it was a tall order, but, um, you know, uh, John and I, um, I think when we, we, we felt that a problem shared is a problem halved, and this sort of uh, this huge task, um, it was like climbing a, I'm going to use the metaphor of climbing a mountain, uh, we just had to make sure you got the right equipment and um, prepare, prepare properly. So we had three weeks uh, a rehearsal, um, and uh, we had a strange, unexpected, we, we, and the rehearsal was great because we practiced all the, the dances and the movements and uh, the, the physicality of uh, Laurel and Hardy and, and also then sort of explored who they were as people. There's obviously we all know what they're like on screen but how they were off screen was a little more difficult but um, there's enough information out there for us to make an informed guess um, and uh, you know there's some uh, uh, archive footage and stuff and, and in interviews so it helps us uh, you know, paint a, a full fuller picture of um, of who they were, um, yeah, and, and, and I mean, so we so we did a lot of rehearsal, and uh, we got to know we got to know each other, and um, uh, and we had makeup, so we just we had the best people around us to make the job as, as easy as possible, or as, as, to mitigate the difficulties. Yeah. Tell me about the first time you saw yourself in the makeup in a, in the mirror. Well, it was uh, pretty uncanny. I mean, at first, John and I were both very uh, anxious about makeup. We thought it would be, unless it was absolutely top draw. Um, and I had the tips of my ears were fake and the bottom of my chin was fake. And I had this teeth guard that pushed my jaw out a little to make it like Stan Laurel's. But um, it, it, I was shocked at how much it really transformed uh, not only the way I looked, but the way you sort of feel and the way you talk. Um, and also John's weight, you know, he wore this fat suit that had proper weight in it. So he, he kind of, he was so overweight in, in, in the uh, later years that uh, he has a little kind of, he rocks as he walks. And, and John, it sort of, you know, it forced John to adopt that kind of uh, walk that was very, uh, it was 
completely believable. Um, and uh, for me, um, we had contact lenses too. I, I had, I, Stan Laurel had blue eyes and I had brown, and Oliver Hardy had brown eyes and John has blue, so <laughs> we needed to swap each other's eyes. Well, that's something easy to fix. Yeah, so we, we, we did that, and, uh, and, and you, you, you look at it yourself in the mirror, and then I looked at John and thought, well, that looks like Oliver Hardy to me. Um, but, uh, yeah. Something I found fascinating when watching it, I didn't know, and I've seen most of their, their work uh, over the years, just like other comedy teams, especially duos, the one that you think on screen is the, the put upon, the dumber one, mm -hmm. uh, the one that, 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 like I'm thinking like Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin, yeah. I think of like Tommy Smothers and, and uh, his brother. Mm -hmm. um, Stan Laurel is the, the writer and sort of the, um, the, the, the one that kind of puts everything together. Uh, that's right, yeah. Um, and Oliver Hardy, uh, I mean, part of the relationship was slightly odd in that Oliver Hardy was really a comic actor um, who, who uh, turned up, did the job uh, when they made the movies. And then as soon as the job was done, he was off uh, gambling or, or, uh, or play on the, playing golf. He just liked to uh, have an you know, uh, enjoyable life, hang out with his friends and be sociable. Uh, whereas Stan was much more driven and more of a workaholic so you know he would be in the edit uh suite um uh, working late and making sure the films were as good as possible so uh so yeah uh, and of course it is odd when you see them on screen because of course stans plays the the, the fool and uh, oliver plays the slightly less foolish fool <laughs> Tell me about working on the the most iconic thing I think most people remember about them is the dance. Uh, yeah, the dance is quite well remembered, and then the piano going down the steps is the other thing. The music box, uh, um, those steps are uh, well, they're in L.A. somewhere. We, we went to we went to photograph in front of them the other day. Talk about uh, well, first of all, you mentioned the steps. I love the 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 part that Jeff wrote in this about. Uh, where, where you're getting to England and then the suitcase goes down the steps. Yeah, we thought, that was such a nice touch. Well, like, there's a couple of moments that seem very, like, so that the, 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 when they're in public, uh, things seem to, uh, that their the, the on-screen personas sometimes, um, you know, would be seen when they're in their private lives because the, the characters they created were extensions of themselves. So we just took that uh, one stage further and Jeff did, uh, it was, that was very nice. And uh, also when they arrive at the hotel, they do a little routine um, for just for the benefit of the, of the receptionist. Yeah. So it's nice to see, uh, to see the overlap, the interplay between the characters and who they were in reality. Well, as I think you mentioned before, what they did on screen, you've got access to that. You can certainly imitate that as well as you can, but the off screen, the private lives, what they said or did is, is, is harder. I, I really would like to know more about how do you play as an actor that that personality trait of Stan where um, Oliver calls him a hollow man? Because that's not something in that moment, that's something Oliver's noticed for years. Uh, yes, yes, and I think, well, I think it's because, um, I think when he says a hollow man, what he's referring to is the fact that Stan is just consumed by his work and has no real life, and that's often the case with people with workaholics is that they, they sacrifice their real life because they're so uh, driven and committed to their work, especially if they're creative, if they're artists. Um, and that, that was uh, certainly uh, some truth in, in that having happened to, to Stan because Oliver was more interested in having a nice life and, and having, you know, in, enjoying his life and being sociable. Um, uh, so, but, but those, those conversations, of course, are all conjecture, you know, right. uh, there's, and, and how they were in, in private is, again, is art artistic license and uh, what we do is make an educated guess and you know it's we have you have the pieces of the jigsaw some of you know all the movies of course we know how they were on screen that's easy to em easier to emulate because you have the, 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 the physical evidence the rest of it is um, a kind of an educated guess uh, you, you, it's like having a jigsaw with um, most of the pieces but some of them are missing and you have to uh, if you like make the missing pieces we're an awards website, so I want to ask you a couple of questions along those lines. We interviewed back you back in the year of Philomena, which brought you two Oscar nominations for writing and producing. 
Tell me about that experience of, of going to the ceremony as a nominee. Uh, well, it was thrilling. I went with my mom and dad, and that was very special, and, uh, and my daughter. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was thrilling. What can I say? Uh, it's as thrilling as you imagine it would be. Um, and uh, I think I arrived. I mean, I was still sort of starstruck by a lot of the other people here. I think I arrived at some function the first day, and... Julia Roberts ran up to me and threw her arms around me and told me how much she loved Philomena and I was uh, a bit... Well, that's uh, a good way to start. I was a bit discombobulated. <laughs> so you, uh, were you invited to join the Motion Picture Academy after the nomination? Yes. yes. Are you in the writer's branch? Uh, I am, yes. yes. So writer's branch but not actor's branch? Um, oh, I don't know, actually. Um, Probably the writer's branch. Normally off of a nomination you get in, yeah. into well, that. I, yeah, well, I, well I, yeah, I remember the kind of, so maybe, uh, yeah. Do you, well, on the nominations phase, you only vote in your branch and for Best Picture, and then on the winner's round, you vote in all 24 categories. Right, right, I see. Right, okay, well, um, yes. Well, when you do vote, I, I love asking Oscar voters mm -hmm. this question, what, you don't have to give specifics yeah. if you don't want to, but what, what kind of a screenplay does grab your attention? What, <laughs> what makes you want to vote for it? Um, I think something which is, uh, is, well crafted and uh, original um, and thought provoking. You know that that I suppose it's supposed to to uh, uh, that's informative, is entertaining, and um, uh, uh, yeah, and and, and educates you in some way. Uh, and also on beyond that, sort of anything really that that um, that tries to find. Um, something positive about humanity I, I would say personally that's uh, uh, I mean um, I don't like anything too bleak not because I don't believe the world can be pretty bleak but because I think that uh, art um, whatever form uh, that the art takes um, good movies are, are, are good art they should um, they should be transformative they should make you think about things in a different way if they're if they're good uh, or, or maybe challenge things you know, it's very, it's very hard to entertain people, uh, and at the same time make them think about something and learn something, and possibly look again at the way they see the world. Uh, that that that's those are the things that, that a good film does, um, I think. And uh, and well, you have the two categories, adapted and original, and you've done both. Do you think it's harder to adapt? A piece of material, or to write something with you know that well, blank page, an uh, original. Well, I would say that it's easier to uh, adapt because you have you have uh, already have some uh, components in it, um, and uh, you know the, 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 any writer will tell you there's nothing worse than a blank page, um, and yeah, adapt is quite good because. Uh, you have to, I mean, the, the advantage with having an original is you can do whatever the hell you like, but if you're adapting something, then you have a template that you have to uh, adhere to in some way. But the, uh, you know, they, they say necessity is the mother of invention, and if you are obliged to uh, follow certain rules, uh, then, then, you know, you, uh, it, it's an easier way to engage with something, I think, and uh, it forces you to... Uh, to be uh, creative, so uh, yeah, uh, uh, adapting is always, always uh, um, more fun. Well, as we wrap up, Stan and Ollie will be out here for uh, the Christmas holidays, and uh, hopefully, a lot of people will see that. But what, what, where will we, where will we see you after that? Um, you will see me uh, in a Michael Winterbottom film that's coming out next year. I don't know uh, at what point, uh, but it's uh, called Greed, um, and. Uh, Yes, that's that's coming out next. That's when you next see me, and um, I'm doing a film. Uh, I've written a film with Jeff Pope, who wrote Stan and Ollie, and uh, he's um, uh, we're, we're gonna be making that next year, um, which is about the hunt for the body of Richard the Third, mm. um, which was found in a car lot in Leicester, in England. Well, this is such a great performance on Stan Laurel for both and and John playing Ollie. So uh, thank you so much, and have a great day. Thank you.